everyone. Thank you all for watching our presentation. Javi and I are going to talk about some empirical research that we did, which suggests that we need a new normativism about collective action. So we're gonna understand collective action as a robust form of sociality that goes beyond non-distributive cases of doing things together like mutual responsive that involves, for example, mutual responsiveness or strategic interaction. Uh, and we're also gonna follow a line of thinking that sees collective action as something explained by collective intention. So we can catalog the features of collective action and then test theories of collective intention by seeing how well they explain those features. What we add to this picture is that we think that experimental philosophy can be a useful tool in understanding what features collective action has. So what we're going to focus on today are the interpersonal obligations of collective action. And given this focus, it makes sense to divide the literature up into two groups. Normativists like Margaret Gilbert and Anthony Myers and Abraham Roth argue that collective action inherently involves interpersonal obligations between the participants resulting in uh, rights to rebuke and entitlements between them. Non-normativists on the other hand, like Michael Bratman, argue that there are cases of collective action that don't involve any interpersonal obligations. Uh, instead, collective action is just something explained by psychological states between the participants, not normative states. So it would be a mistake if collective intention explained these interpersonal obligations since they're not always present. Uh, I'd like to note that this isn't the claim that there are never interpersonal obligations in collective action. It's just that for non-normativists, when there are such obligations, the result of, they're the result of external moral principles based on something like assurance or promising, for example. Uh, the key point is that these obligations are not generated by the collective intention itself. And so the obligations aren't an inherent part of collective action. In the current landscape, the main representatives of these two camps are Margaret Gilbert for the normativists and Michael Bradman for the non-normativists. And we're going to focus specifically on their theories today. Since there isn't time to cover more, uh, they've worked out very well-developed views that allow us to generate lots of predictions. And they've also had a fruitful interaction over the last 30 years or so. <laughs> One key feature of that interaction is a discussion of a walking case. In this case, two people walk together for a brief amount of time when one of them peels off without saying anything to the other. Both agree that this is a genuine instance of collective action, if a minimal one. Where they disagree is that Margaret Gilbert thinks that this case shows that there are interpersonal obligations in even minimal collective actions because the person who is left behind feels like they have the right to say something to the person who leaves. Whereas Michael Bratman takes this to be an instance of a collective action that doesn't involve interpersonal obligations because the person who leaves doesn't feel like they have to say anything to the person left behind. Margaret Gilbert is quite explicit that her justification for this judgment is based on informal observation, including self-observation. Bratman is less explicit, but he does use language which suggests that he agrees. So he says that it would be strained to insist that there are interpersonal obligations in this case. Um, both of them have done a very nice job of showing how their theories differ, the explanations that they would generate for this kind of uh, feature or not. Uh, and they've clearly delineated the battleground. But since then, the debate hasn't moved forward. So we thought that this was a perfect opportunity to employ the tools of experimental research to see whether or not collective action has the features that the normativists think it does or whether it has the features that the non-normativists think it does. So Javier is going to briefly describe our earlier research since it motivates and fills out the background of our present research. Thanks, Matt. So yeah, as we mentioned, we conducted a bunch of studies before on uh, some of the first empirical work using the tools of uh, experimental philosophy on these intuition pumps from social ontology. And these were published in 2019 in Mind and Language. So you can go ahead check out the QR code, which will link you to full draft of the paper. I'm just gonna talk about one of the studies here. And again, we're using XFI, so we're using psychological tools to look at these intuition pumps. 
we had 171 American participants that were divided into three conditions. So this is between subject design. The conditions vary the evidence of joint action or collective action amongst some fictional characters in a vignette from a control condition that has no evidence to a low or liminal condition that borrows directly from the literature to a high condition where it's very clear they're working together. We're just gonna focus on the low one here. So that one, we basically based off these walking together cases from Bratman and Gilbert. And this is actually quite verbatim taken from Bratman, nearly verbatim. And so it reads something like this. Two people are independently walking down Fifth Avenue. They spot each other at 65th Street and briefly walk together chatting until as it happens, one of them peels off of 59th Street. We then asked participants to rate that scenario on two primary measures. One of which asks how, uh, to what extent were the people were acting together from zero to completely. And finally, should the person who peels off notify the other that they're leaving from no obligation to a total obligation to notify. Here are the synopsis of the results. Again, you can check out the paper for more discussion. We do causal modeling as well. So there's lots of stuff to go through there. And just focusing on the togetherness scores, this is a box and whisker plot. So what it shows you is it shows you the distribution of participant responses. The box in the middle represents the 50%, where 50% of the median responses were, and the tails or whiskers represent the upper and lower quartile, so they're upper and lower 25% of responses. Um, the axes represent the medians and we're present, I'm sorry, the means and the thick bars represent the median. So what you can see is across our conditions, there's an increasing perception of togetherness, and this was statistically significant. Um, which is good. That's what we were trying to do, right? We we're trying to vary people's perceptions of how together these characters were. What's really interesting is when you look at these normative measures that we started to pilot here. And what we find is rather than have a stepwise increase, there's a kind of, um, uh, sorry, rather than have a linear increase, there's a stepwise increase. So in both our low and high collective action conditions, you find that people have the intuition that there is an obligation to notify independent of the increasing evidence of togetherness. Once you have enough togetherness, you get these norms as well. That's kind of what we're seeing here. It looks like participants are sensitive to these liminal cases of collective action and they readily detect normative relations amongst their joint actors. So from an empirical perspective, it looks like this is a bonus point for Gilbert. Like maybe she has the right theory and I'm gonna uh, pitch it over to Matt again to help transition to our next study. Thanks, Javier. So since, you know, roughly speaking, it looks like normativists appear to have the upper hand, we thought it'd be a good idea to test whether the details of Gilbert's view capture our everyday intuitions about collective action as well. So for Gilbert, collective intentions are just an interpersonal normative state. It's a state triggered by a certain causal process, namely each participant expressing their readiness to jointly commit to doing something, uh, and this state exists until it's fulfilled or rescinded, and it doesn't need to be realized in the minds of any of the individuals. So none of them need to have a sort of participatory intention towards the collective action. This view of collective intention fulfills three criteria that Gilbert lays out, the disjunction criterion, the obligation criterion, and the concurrence criterion. We're going to focus on the concurrence criterion today it states that the concurrence of all parties is required to change, rescind, or release any of the participants from the collective intention. That is, participants need to seek the permission of co-actors and actually receive it in order to faultlessly leave a collective action. So it's important to note that this is an entailment of her view um, because as she says, the expression of readiness on the part of all is required to start a collective intention and the expression of readiness to change is required to do anything to that collective intention. So we thought that this might get the normative properties wrong. It seems to us at least like acting collectively with others doesn't always require that we seek their permission before leaving. Uh, and so we sought out to test this concurrence criteria. So let me give it back to Javier. Awesome, thanks Matt. So how do we test this concurrence criterion? Well. The normativist prediction is going to be, it's going to be something like follows, that judgments of collective action are going to strongly correlate with an obligation to seek the permission to leave the action, right? So what we've done is we've taken that earlier design, we've 
uh, replicated it and just added a couple things. In particular, we've added a permissibility measure, obviously, and we've added a fourth promising condition where the characters explicitly promise to work together um, to test a different kind of sociality. This, I'm really happy to report, has just been published last month in Phil Quarterly, open access. Um, there's a, another study in there as well and lots of discussion, so please check it out if you're interested. You can uh, link to the QR code um, and happy to talk about that more. So our design here is similar, but we have four conditions between subjects where we had over 200 participants. Um, and we again have a low, oh, sorry, a control, a low collective and a high collective action condition and that fourth new promising condition. The promising vignette is very similar. It's again a walk, walk, it's based on this walking case and it reads as follows. Two people are independently walking down Fifth Avenue. They spot each other at 65th Street and promise to walk together to 55th Street until as it happens, one of them peels off at 59th Street. Our measures, again, we have this new permissibility measure. So it reads as follows. Does the person who peels off have to seek permission to leave from the person who stays? from not at all to completely. Again, it's one of these Likert scales. And to what extent are the two people, were the two people acting together from not at all to completely? So that's the old togetherness measure. And our results, just to give you a bird's eye view, this is what they look like. Again, we're using box and whisker plots that show the distribution of responses. Those aren't error bars. Um, the X's are the means. And we have each condition in a different color. So just focusing, we did, we did find significant main effects across all our conditions. So we have results and to peel apart the results to figure out what's driving them, we're gonna focus on each one, one at a time. So looking at togetherness, what we see is again, a stepwise increase from our control to low to high collective action conditions with our promise condition being statistically similar to a high collective action condition, but with a greater variation of responses. Well, you will notice when we compare it to our original study, which is the same question, right? It's the same question, the same vignettes, except for the pr promise condition, is there's the bars are much, uh, much longer, right? And this indicates that there's a lot more variability in the participant responses. So we're getting a larger range that's happening here, which is kind of unexpected. And we have a, 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 an explanation for that that I'll get into later. But largely participants are in, tracking increasing evidence of collective action, mm -hmm. just as they did before. When we turn to our permission permissibility uh, measure, we get a very different picture than we had with our earlier normative measure. What we're really seeing is that basically most people don't really think you have to an obligation to seek the permission to exit a collective action unless you've made a promise, right? It seems to be a function of promising. Here's a comparison with our notification measure where you can see that one seems to very strongly track uh, perceptions of togetherness. We don't get that for the permissibility measure. It doesn't matter how much evidence of togetherness, people generally don't think there is an obligation to seek permission. In fact, Insofar as we got any effects, it seems like they were driven by our promise condition. So just to kind of paint a, a synopsis of our study, participants did see, seem to track collective action. It largely replicates our 2019 results. Again, we have this change where the, 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 the scores are more skewed, well, not skewed, they're more, there's more variation in the scores, which we have an explanation for. Permission seems to be a function of promising as other conditions were not significantly different from one another. So that's what we just talked about. It looks like in our control, low and high collective action conditions um, are statistically identical. There's no real uh, requirement to seek permission to exit. And finally, what we, we were worried actually uh, about the fact that we only largely replicated our togetherness measures. Remember there's that bar that's longer again. And our, our, our hypothesis to explain this, because it would be good to have pretty similar results to our earlier design, um, is that asking about permission, which is the only thing that really changed across all our conditions, um, might dampen people's intuitions of togetherness. So and having them consider that thing first, and we randomize the order of these questions, but we never tracked that originally. So we actually developed a second study, which we go through in detail in the paper, where we had participants answer, we controlled the order of which question they answered and we included the old notification measure. So what you're seeing here in this graph is just participant responses for our togetherness measure. And what you'll see is the only, in, in, the, low, in the low collective action vignette, 
And what you'll see is it's only when you have participants answered the permission question first that you have a reduction in perceptions of togetherness. So this helps explain why we have a kind of more skewed um, picture than what we were expecting. So with that, I'm gonna uh, hand it off back to Matt to finish up. Uh, thanks, Javier. So I'm gonna focus on some of the consequences of this view for Margaret Gilbert's theory. Um, and it, since it looks like the obligation to seek permission is not a function of acting collectively, there's no empirical support for Gilbert's claim that the concurrence criterion captures an inherent part of collective action. And so equally for the claim that it's a legitimate criterion for assessing theories of collective intention. The main upshot is that people can act together without being obligated to seek the permission of the other parties before leaving. And worse, it looks like exactly that set of normative relations is associated with a different form of sociality, namely mutual promising. So not only does this mean that we should reject the concurrence criterion, it poses a potentially significant problem for Gilbert's view in general. Gilbert thinks that joint commitment is an everyday concept that we all have and that her philosophical work clarifies and systematically articulates that concept so that it can be used in philosophical and social scientific research. And her argumentative structure reflects that belief. So when she addresses views like Bratman's, she often argues against them by appealing to this concurrence criterion and arguing that their failure to capture this feature of intuitively grounded feature of collective action is a reason to reject their views. We can contrast this with Bratman's approach, which takes a technical philosophical concept of intention and then attempts to apply it to a form of sociality. And with that contrast, it becomes clear that this mismatch between intuitions is a much bigger problem for Gilbert since it's part of one of her underpinning premises. So if we accept that experimental research about those intuitional responses can tell us something about the features of collective action that a theory of collective intention should explain, we have reason to think that both Bratman's and Gilbert's views are inadequate. Bratman's view, because our understanding of collective action appears to be normativist rather than non-normativist, and Gilbert's because it gets the normative relations wrong. Still, the failure of Gilbert's view to accurately capture our picture of collective action isn't a reason to reject normativism in general, since based on our earlier research, it looks like that is what our everyday picture is. So what we need is a new normativism, one that gets these relations right. That is one that's appropriately sensitive to our social practices about what we owe each other when we act together. Thank you.